the age of steam. Made in Britain, it was one of the greatest technological breakthroughs the world had ever seen. The train powered Britain's rise to the summit of imperial power, and it changed everything from the food we could eat to the work we could do. Born in the 1830s, the age of steam lasted 130 years and then was gone. But today, as the rest of the world powers towards the future, Close on the truck. a network of 22,000 volunteers and 4,000 staff, like station managers, signalmen, engineers, and drivers, are working together on 130 heritage lines carrying 8 million of us every year. To see the sight, the sounds, the smells, the steam, the coal, everything. It's all there. Wonderful. This is the story of the people who are keeping our railway heritage alive. For them, the age of steam never ended. This is Steam Train Journeys. The East Lancashire Railway runs for 12 and a half miles from Rottenstall in South East Lancashire through five other stations to Haywood in Greater Manchester. Each and every one of the 130 plus heritage railways across the UK and Ireland must maintain a keen lookout for what's up ahead on the track. And that includes potential ways to make money. And at Berry Street Station, Wedding planner, Sophie Mendoza, has 24 hours to transform platforms three and four into a chapel of love. Tomorrow's a really large-scale wedding for us. First of all, they're having their ceremony on the platform. Then they're going to be having like a champagne reception as well with us. Then they're going to go on to our Dining with Distinction train and have a full three-course wedding breakfast um, surrounding beautiful scenery going up and down the line. At that point, we'll transform our platform um, from the daytime venue into the nighttime venue. So there's a lot of different teams working together to make sure it all looks beautiful for the day. This is the first wedding Sophie has managed on her own, and she is keen to impress. So over here at the moment, we've got our area where they're going to get married. Then all of this section here, which is our, our benches where the guests will be seated, will be cleared away. These will be removed, and this will become our dance floor. We'll have um, a lovely hot buffet on here, so we've got caterers delivering a buffet. Further down here, we've got a pop-up bar, so we're going to have full bar service as well. So daytime, beautiful uh, wedding reception. Nighttime, going to be a pumping party venue. But Berry Street Station is only one half of tomorrow's proceedings. One of Great Central's finest steam locomotives, 34092, the City of Wells, will also be playing a starring role. Hold on, mate. Yeah. Fix that. Safe as houses. Right. OK. Sophie's job means she has to be a jack of all trades. But even she may not have done this too often. Oh. Okay, this is fine. Okay, yeah. See? Here you go. Thank you. Okay, okay, First time for everything. Oh, yeah. oh, is it? Oh, That's it, yeah. Is that all right? <laughs> Ta-da! Fab, how do I get down? <laughs> <laughs> it just looks so nice when it pulls in and it says that it makes it much more personal for them. So it's lovely, yeah. Really pleased. But the course of wedding planning never did run smooth. And sure enough, there's a crisis. I'm just getting the Chardellini out now from your little storage on P2. Um, and we're just looking for the champagne flutes. The ones that are here seem to be in black crates, and I'm concerned that they're your dining ones. So I'm not allowed those, am I? Uh, OK. So I was just speaking to the dining manager. That was... These are his glasses, and I can't use those. <laughs> so, yeah, they have to go back. And I need to ring Martin. I was ringing to see if you knew where the wedding and events champagne flutes are. You know, we used them last time. I don't know where they went after that. Um, and they're not in Andy's cupboard because they're here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course it will. 
but missing champagne flutes aren't likely to throw a woman of Sophie's calibre off kilter for long. There's some champagne flutes, but some the two on different sets of carriages, which are in the sheds at the moment. So we're just going to probably just buy some, <laughs> buy some new fresh ones so that we've definitely got enough for tomorrow, because um, time is of the essence. So. <laughs> Most weddings involve a degree of set dressing and anxiety about the gluten-free starters, but very few of them have to contend with a passenger train timetable. There will be normal service trains operating, so you've got to know in advance where the trains are coming from, where they're going to, what platforms they're going to be based in, um, so that you can coordinate things safely and effectively. Tomorrow's star-crossed lovers are Michelle and Joe and Sophie is anxious to do them proud. It's really personal, and especially because you've met them and you know, sort of, you don't know them, but you know about them and you just want it to be, like, perfect for them, really. So each event, you want to do your best, but it's someone's wedding day, so it's quite important. So. I'll smarten that up tomorrow. OK. Um, Ivy. Ivy! <laughs> you know when I'm getting stressed when I start to sing? <laughs> After eight long hours, and with the Berry Street station master keen to shut up shop for the day, are Sophie and her crew running on time? So I need to get champagne flute sorted. Kind of a key element. <laughs> I think that looks really nice. I'm happy with that. I think pretty much done for this evening, so all that's left to do is kind of give everywhere a good clean and tidy tomorrow. Um, I'll be ready for the bride and groom. The South Devon Heritage Railway runs for six miles from Buckfast Lee to Totnes. The railway owns three steam locos that would once have worked on the Great Western Line. But South Devon has a problem. One locomotive, 5786, was on loan to another heritage railway when it developed issues and had to be brought home. They had to send a second replacement and so now only have one operational loco for themselves. And with the tourist season just around the corner, it's all hands to the pump. Or in this case, Ray Lee's hands. Unfortunately, it, uh, it was on hire uh, and a couple of flu tubes, there's some big tubes up in the boiler, one of them developed a leak, so we've had to call it back, take them out, replace them, so now we're due to do a steam test on it, and then it could be back in service, and then we'll be back on the 13 uh, to try to catch up a bit of lost time. Unlike the ongoing maintenance issues that Network Rail faces each day, the Heritage Railways have the same problems, but much worse. For one simple reason, steam is old tech. And hanging on to the engineering expertise that knows how to fix things is a challenge. And the job today is to bring it up to pressure to test it. Yesterday, we filled it with water and let it sit, sit overnight. We put a warming fire in it last night, late last night, which has warmed it up. And today, we will bring it round uh, to, to uh, somewhere near blowing off pressure, hopefully, depending on uh, how well it warms up. We're not going to force it, and we'll just see how we go. Ray's mission is simple. Push the boiler's pressure until it blows off. That is, there's too much steam and it needs venting. But first, there's work to be finished inside the firebox. Its fire bricks have been removed and Ray and his assistant Joe must replace them. This bar here sits on these lugs. The brick arch sits on there. You'll see in a minute that it's got a, a cut out around it like that. So we start from this end and we work back. Fire bricks are used to redirect unburned carbon particles and gases back into the firebox so that less smoke is expelled from the chimney, making the engine more efficient. But they often need replacing after five years. That's all right, isn't it? Yeah, that's going to settle down. So that's the first section. And as you see, it forms an arch, stops it falling. This is the key brick, which is keeping these two front ones in. Then all we're going to do now is bring the next section back and on we go. Right, so, can we have the next two in, please? Okie dokie. 
Look at that. See how the line goes down there, look? Yeah, oh, it's a work of art, isn't it? Beautiful. With new fire bricks in, all valves checked, all that's missing is a fire. Twenty-two-year-old trainee engineer Joe Malloy has been volunteering here for three years, which means he's the right man to start one. Yes, yeah, so I've got my got my rags here. This is what I'll be starting the fire with. But to do that, I'll be soaking them in paraffin. Can't have a chance to light, so I'll have to crack on. Most firemen have their own individual ways of lighting fires. But what I'll do, I'll light some paraffin, put some wood on, and then I'll be followed by coal. I think the appeal for me is that it's not a conventional job. You know, you get your hands nice and dirty. There's only so much a book can teach you. You know, and there is room for sort of some of the more academic stuff that I've learned through university. There is room for that. Um, you know, when you think, of, think about steam engine, yes, it boils water, but there's a lot of complicated systems along the way. You might as well burn that as well, whatever that is. A bit of roof or something. Unlike getting the coals glowing nicely on the barbie, boiling a giant kettle like this is a much, much bigger job. We generally look at warming up over a, an eight to 10 hour period, just taking the chill off of it and then bring it into steam after that. And we use another six hours before we actually do any steam testing. From cold to actually blowing off would be somewhere in the region of 16 to 20 hours. That way all the plate is warmed up and is all expanded nicely. You haven't put any shocks into it. Um, and it's a, good, it's a good thing for the boiler. I was once told you wouldn't expect somebody to kick them out of bed and do the four minute mile straight away. So that's how we sort of relate to a steam engine. Are we doing this box? That's all right. With that in mind, Ray only has another hour or so to wait until 5786 is fit to burst. Blower's turned off. And he and it can blow off steam to his heart's content. The Dartmouth Heritage Railway runs from Paynton, seven miles down to Kingswear in Devon. Here, passengers can cross the estuary to Dartmouth by ferry and enjoy something very special indeed. The UK's last remaining coal-powered paddle steamer. As the UK's rail network exploded in size during the 19th and early 20th centuries, several rail companies also operated boat services alongside their trains allowing passengers to reach more remote destinations. And although today a modern ferry ploughs the Kingsweir Dartmouth route, there's also the world's oldest operating steam-powered paddle steamer, SS Kingsweir Castle, which is still transporting tourists up and down the estuary and back in time. But the crew of the paddle steamer have a logistical problem. Kingsweir has no coal storage depot. It must be delivered personally in one of the Dartmouth Steam Railway's Class 37 diesel locos by Barry Damon. Well, today's journey is to deliver coal that's stored usually at Paynton for the steam engines, but we take some from there in wagons to Kingswear for the um, Kingswear Castle paddle steamer. <laughs> We've got about 20 tonnes in the wagons on this train. We try and pick a day when we're running a quiet timetable so that we can run in between the steam service and not uh, disturb it. These days, ironically, imported Russian coal is used as it's clean burning and more eco-friendly. To power its 100 horsepower engine, the Kingsweir Castle burns half a ton of it a day.
and deck manager, Stuart Irvine, has the happy job of getting it all from train to engine room. Twice a week, so on a Monday and a Thursday, we fill up with coal, because she only holds four tonnes and we use half a tonne a day, so we do have to take it on twice a week. As yet, Stuart hasn't figured out an alternative to manpower and a number of wheelbarrow loads. So we're at nine now, which is what we use on average day. So possibly we're going for possibly 18, maybe 21, something like that. Stuart has just 25 minutes to get all 20 odd wheelbarrows of coal on board before the local ferry will need the jetty. When we get close to finishing, Dan, the engineer, he'll go down and rake it flat. So at the moment, it's in a big, steep pile. So what he'll do is, is he'll go down and start raking it flat, so making it more level. So we know we're close when he's starting to do that. When we first got the boat, I didn't think we were going to be doing this kind of thing, but it's all good fun. It's all part of working on the paddle steamer, really. Poor half. Yes, please. A little bit more. That last one? Hang on. Yeah, OK. Is that it? Oh, that's it, mate. Yep. That was 20. Excellent. The Kingsweir Castle is now ready for a predicted deluge of tourists tomorrow. Till then, it's off to its moorings for a good night's rest. It's 10.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. In just four hours, young lovers, Michelle and Joe, are tying the knot on platform two of Berry Street Station on the East Lanx Railway. Wedding planner, Sophie Mendoza, has been set dressing since yesterday. And apart from making sure that food, guests, drink, and the happy couple are all ready at 2.30, she has to pull all this off between the schedule and noisy service that will continue to operate. Just doing the final preparation, all the stuff that we couldn't do yesterday because it was potential for it to get dirty, because obviously we've got so many trains coming through, so all our nice white things can't go out the day before. Obviously, we're running on a normal timetable as well, so we've got lots of members of the public around. The weather's looking really good for today. I'm so happy. I'm absolutely thrilled about that, and it'll be lovely for the bride because there's nothing you worry about more on your wedding day than rain, so hopefully... Apart from setting up the bar, last-minute checks and getting changed, Sophie has one other thing to worry about. Champagne flutes. Some have been located on another train, but she still needs more and is keen to avoid buying replacements. They wanted some wine glasses on the elbow. Do you know yes. anything about them, where they are? I brought you... No. <laughs> champagne flutes and brought yeah. them. Oh, thank you. Um, what time is it departing? Like, now? Yeah. If you can't do it now, we can take them on when they can, come back. Yeah, now. when they come back from Haywood, and I'll ring yeah. Martin now, well, so... I can do that. Yeah, I'll ring him and I'll ask him to source some. Um, if you could let Brian know that they'll be here when he comes back from Haywood, that would be really lovely. OK. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Can we source a dozen wine glasses for the Obbo for its return from Haywood? The, the yes, yes. <laughs> no, 
I'm just feeling the pressure of time at the moment, so not really concerned. I'm just conscious that I've got to get everything done as quickly as possible. <laughs> After a tense wait, and thanks to the heroics of passenger services manager Martin McCann, the remaining champagne flutes have been unearthed. Uh, you know, we must have run out. We've got two tall rocks to ride the room. Well, Brian said they were long stem in there. I'll, I will check. Check! <laughs> They're short stem as well. We only have these. Sophie had her own wedding day pictures taken at Berry Street Station, so understands what this place means to many people locally. People have a lot of memories. People that I know that work here talk about their parents who worked here or their uncle who've worked here years and years and years ago. So when you're working here and you're working among people who know of that history and its actual live history, um, it does make you feel quite privileged, really. It's now 2 p.m. and getting close to the bride-to-be's arrival. We are ticking things off really well. So drinks are ta reception tables set up, tablecloths. Uh, so done that. Tables are set, flowers are arranged, and champagne flutes have been rescued. Sophie can do no more. I just need to change my outfit, makeup on, and I'll be back down to meet the groom in just a few minutes' time. What's it going to go to, about 50, 60? Yeah, probably 60 by the end. No, just let him, let him go out now. Let him go out now. South Devon Railway's 1930-built locomotive 5786 has been on loan to another heritage railway. But when it developed problems, it had to be brought home. The busy summer season is just around the corner, and it's vital 5786 is returned to Rude Health ASAP, which is where Ray Lee comes in. So the plan now is to do a full steam test on it, which brings it up nice and slowly. We're looking at about another three or four hours before it actually blows off. Ray is happy the new flu tubes are watertight. Any leaks immediately reduce the efficiency of the engine. Next, the all-important steam test. Although it may not leak under water pressure, it may leak under steam, which is why you have to do a steam test. And then if that all passes, um, we're going to put it on the passenger train this afternoon and test it that way, make sure the brakes work and he's all in beat and everything, and we tightened everything up. This class of engine uses coal to boil 12,000 gallons of water. But has Ray got enough? So we will open the gauge glass, and there we go. The gauge glass is full up. When we're doing a boiler, uh, a steam test, we fill him right up to there. Um, We've had one or two incidents in my experience where a mud old door started leaking or something's gone a little wrong. And believe you me, when something's going wrong with 200 PSI on the clock, this water level goes down very quickly. Uh, so I always fill them up there. I instruct all our lot. We fill them up to there. If something's gone wrong, you're emptying the fire out, you're doing something, you're acting before the water comes in sight. Young apprentice Joe Malloy has started a fire. But to get the steam pressure up close to 200 PSI, it takes Ray's years of know-how to ensure it really gets going. This is a square flat box. Square flat box on a Western engine loves what we call a saucer fire. Up in the corners, thin in the middle. When he's out there working, you have to flap up, and when the sparks stop jumping out, he wants one in each corner. That's what these love. Phil, our generation, are the hard done by ones. We spent most of our time taking them out of Barry and scrapyards and getting them all going. So you've had all the boys up to that point, running it as a business, doing it, doing it as a profession. We've come along and saved and got done all the hard work with very little equipment and everything, getting them going. And now we've got all these engines preserved. We've got easier ways of making cylinders and everything. So the next generation on, I've got it easy. But hell, that's life, isn't it? Still wouldn't have changed it. So.
When trains started arriving in Kingsweir in South Devon in 1864, passengers faced a problem. No viaduct existed to allow their train to cross the River Dart and continue onwards to Dartmouth, a town 25 miles away by road or a mere third of a mile by boat. So the railway offered a solution. A paddle steamer would transport passengers the short distance across the river to their journey's end. And the last of these steamers in service is the SS Kingsweir Castle, and Richard Swinglehurst is its skipper. So the boat was built in 1924 at the shipyard of Philip and Son here on the River Dart. Um, but the engine itself was built in 1904 down in Cox & Co in Falmouth for a different vessel. It wasn't until that vessel came out of service, the engine was then put into this vessel when they built it. Like the South Devon Railway itself, the Kingsweir Castle today is based in Dartmouth and is a tourist attraction only, carrying 235 sightseers at a time up the river to Totnes and back. The mornings are really busy. Um, it's pretty much non-stop from when we arrive um, at 8 o'clock um, until we leave the pontoon here at 11. There's so much to do on the boat to clean it, do all the brass. And it takes about three hours for the engine to warm before we can actually move her, so it's quite a lot to do. While Brasso is being vigorously applied above decks, below, engineer Nigel Thomas is tending to his beloved pistons. At the moment, I'm just oiling the uh, crankshaft bearings. Um, the, the, the two of these pots feed each each bearing. There's four bearings. I only need to top them up at the, at the beginning of the day, and it just feed, drip feeds itself through a wick. Well, it's called a trimming throughout the day. By modern standards, the Kingsweir Castle is low powered, only 100 horsepower, so must work at maximum efficiency. Today we'll be running about 32 revs per minute, and you know there's a hell of a lot of torque, and that's enough to drive the paddle wheels at seven knots, something like that. It's, it's big enough for the job, just. <laughs> Nigel needs the engine to deliver full power instantly, as the ship can't be steered properly until it's moving. Just uh, spreading the fire a bit over the whole grate, and then I can put more coal on and build the fire up a bit. This is for all to raise steam. So we've got enough steam to leave the uh, pontoon here um, at about 11 o'clock. So I need about 100 PSI plus at that moment. The ship carries two, uh, two tons of coal either side, bunker there, bunker on the other side. And we get through about half a ton a day on average. Today we'll probably get through a little bit more as we're running up to Totnes, and I know we're against the tide coming back, so we'll be running fairly flat out, I think, on the way back. On the dot of 11 at Kingsweir Station, Steam Loco 34046 unloads its happy band of day trippers. Meanwhile, across the estuary at Dartmouth, the Kingsweir Castle is ready and waiting for them. And skipper Richard Swinglehurst has long been intrigued by the station here. Behind us, you can see a building called Platform One. And Platform One, for many years, was called the Station Restaurant. Um, but originally started its life supposedly as a train station back in the 1850s. Now, Isambard Kingdom Brunel was responsible for bringing a train line down to the village of Kingsweir, which is just opposite us here in Dartmouth. But he originally wanted to bring it into Dartmouth, a more popular destination. But in the end, he wasn't allowed to build a viaduct across the river, but he was rather confident and sure that he would get permission for it that he built a train station in Dartmouth in anticipation of his viaduct coming over the river to bring his train track down uh, to Dartmouth. But of course he wasn't allowed, so that then left a train station in Dartmouth that has never seen and never will see track or train run to or from it. From its birth in 1924, 
the Kingsweir Castle has played several parts. The US Navy operated it as a harbour tender during World War II. Well, I might try and put her straight in and then come off and turn her that way. Okay. Engineer Nigel's hard work below decks means the 115-year-old steam engine is now ready to paddle its excited passengers out into the River Dart. So the route we're taking today would have been a very similar route to the boat would have taken um, back in her heyday between 1924 and 1965 when she ran here. The Kingsweir Castle looks like it still has plenty of life left in it, and its skipper, for one, loves her to bits. We keep her running because she's the only one. We feel a, a sense of duty, I think, to keep, to keep these old things running so future generations can see um, what life was like back in the day, of course, um, which you don't have many things nowadays that are 100 years old or more. Um, so we feel that's quite important to keep, you know, to keep her running, and to keep her running almost as she was, you know, nearly 100 years ago. In the cab of Loco 5786, South Devon Railway's most experienced engineer, Ray Lee, has perfectly stoked his fire and created precisely 200 pounds per square inch of steam pressure. It's now time for the engine's final and critical safety test. What's going to happen now, we're blowing him around. I'm going to shut that off. The reheat, the safety valve will start to feather. There's two valves up there, one set slightly higher than the other. So the safety valve will start to hiss in a minute. And what we're going to do then, we'll end up doing what they call an accumulation test, whereas the fire, it cannot produce more steam than we can safely get rid of. If the safety valves were gagging, which meant the needle carried on going up, we've got a problem. We would have to shut the fire out and have a look at it. He's on the mark, the needle is bang on the line. He's just beginning to lift. There you go. So, we're now blowing round a bit more. As you can hear, the noise is getting louder, which means he's trying to create above the safety valve, look. Second valve's coming up to lift now. If I turn this off. The pair of valves lifted out, so both valves are lifted. It will not go any further. We're within our following teeth. I'm now going to climb it down. Right, so we're well, already spinning away. Right, so the boilers pull up. This injector works fine. This injector's doing it. Cut up now, I'll let the needles bang on 200. And he shut up. So that means they can now run this engine, bang on the line. He is, he'll be his maximum efficiency. Every, every gallon of water and every pound of coal we put in there will be used to its best. So that's a successful test, all right? Both ejector work. We now got to have a little walk around to make sure that everything's okay. We'll just bring the water level back. There we go. Despite Ray now being happy that the boiler is able to produce enough steam pressure to drive the wheels, the last check is inside the smoke box, where spent steam and fuel exhaust mix before being expelled through the chimney. So we've looked for the flue tubes. They're all dry as a bone. The plugs are all dry. There's no water leaks at all, so that side of it's signed off lovely. And we'll just steam test the pipes. But that's a job we're going to do in a minute. Would you go and put the steam brake on, yep. mid-gear drain cocks closed, yep. and just give it a little charge on the regulator? So what Chris is going to do now, 
He's one of our shed drivers. Gonna put it in mid gear, put the brakes on. He's just gonna give it a breath of steam so we can see if the pipes are leaking. On. Both pipes are, are dry as a bone. And the final proof of the pudding is the 5786, ready for action again. Even the small kids, they come on the platform and you can see in their eyes that there's this great big monster sat there, quiet as anything, and it'll chuff off down the line. Everybody's enjoyed it. It's, it's just taken us back to a day when beer was cheap and it was good to smoke, wasn't it? And um, you see it just... And every evening when it comes in, it's a breathing, living thing. When it's got a fire in it, it's a breathing, living thing. Platform 2 at Berry Street Station, train enthusiast Joe and a crowd of expectant guests await the arrival of his intended Michelle. Hello! Nice to see you. Are you OK? Good. But not until the departure of the 225 to Haywood. Wedding planner Sophie Mendoza has set the stage for a wedding with a difference. Bang on time, it's half past two, so we're just going to wait for two trains to depart and then crack on with the ceremony. There are between five and ten weddings staged here each year, bringing in vital revenue to fund the ongoing preservation of the line. But that doesn't mean that guests can do what they like. We can't actually have confetti thrown, unfortunately. You can do it anywhere else but not on the, on the railway premises. Finally, the coast is clear. Time to get the show on the road.
No matter how crazy the idea must have seemed to invite a 1949 light Pacific class 67 foot long steam locomotive to a wedding, never mind. It would seem to be the perfect guest. We've been here quite a bit. And it's something different, and I'm a bit of a train buff if you ask anyone, so it was a bit of a, a choice of here, but no one else, nowhere else really, wasn't it? <laughs> Thought we were a bit crazy at first until they got the idea about it, and then they kind of got the idea we liked it then. <laughs> Once it come together. <laughs> Act one is over. The guests now depart for their onboard wedding breakfast, leaving Sophie just two hours to effect another set change. This is the sort of transformation times. This is the bit that I was most worried about, but it's also the bit that I've been planning the most as well. We are transforming this from a daytime wedding venue into a nighttime wedding venue, so that when the train comes back in, it's all magical wonderland of evening entertainment for them. <laughs> There's going to be 110 people, so we need places for everyone to sit. Tables are set. The DJ checks sound levels. The bar is stopped. The wedding cake is decorated and bunting strung inside another train carriage to provide extra seating during the evening's revelries. And with two hours gone in a flash, the city of Wells arrives back to deliver its happy cargo. An evening of breadsticks, dips and dancing queen lies ahead for the bride, groom and guests. And for Sophie, the satisfaction of a job well done. Right, and say everything's done from our perspective, so it's just time for them to have a great time.